So care of the neonate, what are we going to do? Uh, one is energy conservation, so we keep these kids prone until they're stable. Caring for their skin, they have very thin, very fragile skin, so no alkaline soaps at all. Medications, when we give these kids meds, many uh, neonates are allergic to the, the bacteriostatic additive, um, it, like in your normal saline, those multi-dose vials have a bacteriostatic additive. We do not use those at Children's. We use the single use only vials because we don't want that, that bacteriostatic uh, additive in there. And we also don't use very hyperosmolar solutions. Uh, their veins won't handle it. We want to think about developmental intervention and care, even on these little ones. And the neonatal pain. There are neonatal pain scales and family support and involvement. Hyperbilirubinemia, I'm sure you talked about this in OP. Uh, it's diagnosed not just on a uh, blood level of bilirubin. They also are going to look at the child's age, gestational age, weight, how well they're feeding, how well they're stooling, and the child's blood type. Uh, the smaller they are and gestationally younger, the liver's not as mature, they're not going to be able to bind that bilirubin. Uh, if they're not eating well and stooling, this is where they get rid of the majority of that bilirubin. It's going to get reabsorbed from the gut back into the bloodstream. And then uh, blood type, and especially looking at that compared to mom's blood type. Therapeutic management of the hyperbilirubinemia. Our goal is to prevent encephalopathy. Uh, we used to call this connectorosis, but basically it is brain damage. And we don't see that a lot anymore. We're doing a good job with preventing that, uh, but that's our goal. We, the treatment is phototherapy. We use lights to bind that bilirubin and then the body can get rid of it and the uh, prognosis really depends on how high that bilirubin was and, and how young and small the baby was. But overall, the, overall we're doing very well with these kids. We don't see that level of brain damage um, from hyperbilirubin that we used to. A child who's on the lights, and you'll get this weird blue glow in the room. It's kind of eerie looking. Uh, we need to cover their eyes because it can damage their retinas and we want as much of the skin exposed to the light as possible so generally these kids are in they have the eye cover on and other than that only a diaper and I've even seen when the if the levels are pretty high they'll just open a diaper underneath the kid if they're prone and if they have them on their back they'll just lay like a little washcloth or something uh, over the the genitals and a diaper underneath so that we're not covering their whole bottom. A newborn, a diaper can cover a lot on them. The baby on the bottom is laying on top of a phototherapy blanket. It has um, just multiple little points of light that come out and so you can have the light overhead as well as the light underneath. Now, hemolytic disease of the newborn this is usually from RH incompatibility with the mom or uh, ABO blood type incompatibility. Often this is going to need to be treated with an exchange transfusion. So we're taking the baby's blood out and exchanging it for the same blood type but from a donor. So we're taking um, the baby's blood out. The baby's blood is hemolyzing, you know, breaking down. Uh, and really what we want to do to prevent this is to prevent the mom from becoming sensitized. This RH isoimmunization and the way we do that is with Rogam. And this next slide shows what happens is mom's RH negative, baby's RH positive. As long as their blood doesn't mix, there's not really a problem, but often, particularly during labor, Mom will get exposed to a little bit of baby's blood and those 
Rh proteins on the blood, mom's body senses that they're foreign and begins to make antibodies against them. Baby's fine, nothing happens. The next pregnancy, however, mom has these anti-RH antibodies in her, her bloodstream. These can cross the placenta. So now the baby is getting anti-RH antibodies into its little tiny developing body which clump up its blood because it has those RH proteins on there. So typically what you get is every pregnancy you'll have a higher level of um, retardation and just uh, complications for the baby. If we give mom that Rogam, uh, they do it at several points during the pregnancy and within, I think it's 48 hours after, it prevents, even if she's been exposed to the baby's blood, it prevents her from making those anti-RH antibodies. So on the next pregnancy, her body doesn't have those and you know, it, it's just fine, nothing happens to the baby. Our big problem with premature babies is this respiratory dis distress syndrome. Uh, and this is because they have uh, the unfolding of their alveoli. It occurs in the last trimester, so they still have all these closed alveoli. They're not opened up, and um, you know they just don't have enough to exchange gases. So they're born with numerous underdeveloped and uninflated alveoli. This limits their pulmonary blood flow. We never decrease the, uh, the uh, pulmonary um, pressure over there. Oxygen is a vasodilator, uh, so when they breathe, it dilates those capillaries in the lungs, which lowers the pressure in the, the pulmonary pressure, that doesn't happen. So that's, that's the problem with not having those. And then at birth, these kids have to keep their lungs inflated and increase that pulmonary blood flow 10 times in order, I mean a baby does, in order to close um, the ductus arteriosus and the foramen ovale, the fetal cardiac structures, they can't do that. The premature baby can't. Which makes them prone to this respiratory distress syndrome. So what happens? They have decreased surfactant. They just haven't made it. Uh, surfactant is sort of like putting some soapy water between two pieces of saran wrap. They don't stick together. If you don't have it, they do, and you can't open it. So that's what's going on inside the alveoli. We don't have that surfactant. They're sticking together. You get some that are more mature and have uh, are able to open, but not all of them. So you get this unequal inflation of the alveoli. So you have some areas where they're all closed, and you get atelectasis. That area of the lung closes or collapses. When that's collapsed, you have this increased pulmonary vascular resistance. So now the blood flow, it's harder for blood to flow there, so it won't, which means we get hypoperfusion. Blood is not flowing there. This is going to keep the right side, the pressures in the right side of the heart, higher than the left, so blood is going to continue to shunt from the right to the left side through the ductus arteriosus and through the foramen ovale. These are what the baby did in utero that should have stopped once they start breathing but haven't. Because they're shunting blood and not exchanging the gas, um, they're sending that unoxygenated blood back to the body so they're going to be hypoxemic, low in oxygen, and they're going to be hypercapnia, hypercapnia, high CO2s. Now this causes a decrease in the O2 tension, less O2 in the bloodstream, which causes vasospasms and it causes a decrease in the pH. Decreased pH 
causes vasoconstriction, which means we're having more trouble circulating blood and we're not getting the materials that we need to make the surfactant out to the alveoli where it needs to be made. So all of that leads to hyaline membrane formation, which is stiff um, lungs. It's sort of like scar tissued lungs. So the lungs become stiff and they require a lot require a lot more pressure to open up those alveoli in order to do any gas exchange. And this is really what we're worried about the first 72 hours, really critical the first 72 hours. This is the same thing I just said in words, showing it a little more in a picture. So we need to assess this baby's breathing. And you can see there's different things that they're, they're looking at and they can be graded um, you know, zero if they're normal, grade one or grade two. And we're looking at the chest. Chest expansion should increase on inhalation and come back down on exhalation. If there's a lag, so they breathe, and then the chest expands. There's a, a lag there, that's a grade one. If you get this seesaw, um, so the chest goes down and the abdomen goes up on inhalation and uh, you know the chest and the abdomen are going opposite of each other. It's kind of a seesaw. That's a grade two. And then we look at the lower chest for retractions. No retractions, just visible or marked retractions. Xiphoid retractions, same thing, none, mild or, or marked. Nasal flaring, none, minimal or marked. And an expiratory grunt. So um, with every expiration, uh, uh, it's, um, a way to keep some positive pressure in there. Uh, no grunt is the zero, something that you can hear only with a stethoscope is a one, or if you can hear it audibly with a naked ear, that's a two. So how do we manage this respiratory distress syndrome? Well, we've got to ventilate these kids. They end up on a ventilator and we're giving them O2. We've also got to correct the acid-base balance. Um, I said many of the, the things that are not working right produce acid. Uh, it's a waste product that we're making and we're not getting out because we're not perfusing well. So we've got to watch their acid-base balance. We've got to keep them warm. If they get cold, again, they're not going to perfuse well. They're going to make those acidic waste products. We're not going to get them out. We've got to look at tissue perfusion and oxygenation. Are we getting oxygen out to all the tissues that need it. We've got to prevent hypotension and uh, we've got to make sure that their hydration and electrolytes stay in balance. Some of the complications when these kids get respiratory distress syndrome, pneumothorax, the pressure it takes to uh, keep those lungs functioning um, as best we can, sometimes it's too much. Uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. This is kind of the long-term complication. The lungs get scarred and stiff and never are really normal. As the child grows and produces more lung tissue, hopefully the new tissue is normal, but uh, we've got some damaged tissue there. Patent ductus arteriosus, so that is supposed to close after birth, but it doesn't retinopathy of prematurity. This is blindness and this is actually from high levels of oxygen. We try and turn that O2 down as quickly as we can but we're also having a lot of trouble ventilating this child. The high levels of oxygen uh, do damage to the retina and the child can end up blind. Intracranial hemorrhage uh, one of the very severe complications, bleeding in the brain and necrotizing enterocolitis. This is uh, well, necrotic, meaning dead. Some of, some of the intestine dies and we have to take it out and these kids can end up with very little intestine, not enough to live on.